Richards channel, where you always learn a multitude of key concepts to improve your painting skills. Hey there, this is the painting that we're going to be doing. Uh, it is a chateau in Switzerland. Um, this is episode one of four. Awesome. I'm ready. Okay. All right. Um, so uh, welcome again to the Arts Place of Stokes um, in Danbury, North Carolina. Um, we're going to have another uh, paint class today. I appreciate y'all being here. And uh, today uh, we're going to talk about one concept that is really important in being able to get us to go to a particular spot in our paintings. That's been just kind of an ongoing theme lately, is that I wanted to kind of get across the concept that whenever you're uh, doing a painting, you're not just trying to get people to look at, at your painting, but you want them to be drawn in to a particular location in the painting. Um, when I'm looking at this uh, photo reference, um, what uh, do y'all think that might be the thing that would draw us into this painting? The mountains, the, the lighter mountains in the very beginning. Okay, or? so the, uh, the snow peaked mountains. Mm -hmm. Okay, anybody else have anything else? Is that a castle? It a is wall? a castle, yeah. That uh, catches my eye. Yeah, that right there, um, you can't tell a lot that it's a castle from this angle, but I, I went and looked at uh, just multiple pictures of this castle. Uh, it's called uh, Chilion uh, in France. And, uh, um, and from other angles, you can most certainly see that it's kind of a traditional looking castle with the turrets and all of that sort of thing, you know. Um, yeah, uh, when I look at this photo reference, I am torn between those mountains and the castle. Uh, by and large, as we were talking about uh, last week, week before last, if there's a man-made object, it trumps nature. It has a tendency to. But those mountains, there's such grandeur to those mountains that they are really holding their own. As a matter of fact, I, you know, I was drawn to this picture because I'm like, holy cow, that is a beautiful place. It's just fairy tale looking, you know. So um, anyway, we. Uh, we will try to bring out some of this about the mountains, but we have to make a decision. You can't, in your painting, as you're trying to create that uh, uh, point of interest in your painting, you can't have that duplicity about it that this photograph has. So the, the photograph is leaving us with, mm, I'm kind of looking at both things. Um, we want to kind of look at one thing, and I, I'm going to focus on the castle uh, today. Um, and the reason is, is because today's uh, uh, concept that I'm trying to, to portray is uh, something that is called warm and cool colors. And so anything on one side of the color wheel um, is going to be warm colors, um, yellows. And reds and oranges are considered to be the warm colors on the color wheel. Um, our purples, our blues, our greens, those are all considered to be cool colors. Now, when you're talking about warm and cool, it's not an either or. Um, so you can't say uh, all greens are cool, you know, because uh, what, what it is is it's cool compared to what? Um, for instance, this uh, kind of yellow green color, that's that spring green that you see sometimes like uh, when the willow branches are just starting to push out new leaves and they're that bright green. As a matter of fact, uh, the value of them could be much lighter. So in other words, from light to dark, that color of green could be uh, incredibly lighter and it would really stand out as being almost electric. Um, and so it, it would feel very warm because of that, because of the uh, high chroma. Uh, high chroma and warm have a tendency to kind of be compatible, um, although they are different things. Um, so 
so this green um, would be actually kind of a warm color. Um, but now when we start getting over here into the blue range of green, so there's uh, blue green, um, it's definitely going to be cool unless we put it up against something that is even cooler. And then all of a sudden now that green even might seem a little bit warmer than uh, say just a, a really ultraviolet purple sort of color or you know some kind of really deep uh, subdued blue you know that kind of thing so um, anyhow if you don't have a color wheel a color wheel is a great great tool to have um, at some point you'll just have it up here and, and you really won't need the physical thing much anymore but you won't get to here unless you keep this and, and use it so um, okay I'm gonna just do a little bit of painting and I just wanted to talk about warms to cools. So <laughs> I actually warmed up this photo. I wanted to see what it was gonna look like if it got a little warmer. Um, I manipulated it on the computer. Um, it was actually way more uh, bluer by and large. And um, so I, I still want to kind of keep with that blue sort of direction with this. But having said that, um, look at all the blue we got going on, even though I warmed it up some, even though I brought kind of the brown highlights out of things. Um, you know, it, it, it's just really, really blue. So when you're doing that, like particularly if you've got nice mountain scene where the mountains are marching back into the distance, feel the freedom to be able to kind of alter some of those so that everything doesn't feel exactly the same, like you're just painting the same blues over and over again. You can go into uh, grays. This is, this is a concept um, called uh, atmospheric density. Um, which is just a fancy artistic name for humidity. <laughs> so, uh, what, what it means is, is that as we look at stuff um, that we're seeing through the water that's in the air, and, and so if there's a, something that's way off in the distance, um, the actual light spectrum gets kind of sucked out of what we're seeing by all that water that it's having to go through. So if we're looking at a mountain that's a mile away, we may still see green. If it's four miles away, you know, it may begin to start looking more bluish. If it's 10 miles away, it's gonna be bluish. And, uh, and if it's 20 miles away, it may have even lost the blues and it may just be gray. And so we can kind of play with that as we're introducing this. Okay, first thing I'm going to do is just lay in, oops, I grabbed the wrong color. Um, we're going to lay in that sky blue and I'm going to lighten it up and I'm going to make it a little more blue than what I've got in this reference. As a matter of fact, that's kind of like bam. I don't mean to steal from Emerald, but um, you know, that's, that's pretty powerful, that blue. I think it'll tone down as we begin to introduce some other things. Um, anytime that you're laying in a big block of value and color, you can start creating textures right off the get-go. And so we've got all these clouds and that just makes a little soft thing going on there. Then where it got caught knee over in here, um, we can push in a little bit more. And this, this isn't the end of your painting right here as far as those clouds, but it, it's a nice little start to it. And then where the cumulus clouds, where the light's hitting the tops of them, um, it, it, we can extract out by just kind of um, doing some little pushes with that paper towel. And you see how now um, I'm not doing a painting, but I'm setting up for the painting, right? So you can tell kind of where we're going with this. The, there's some really nice clouds down here close to the mountains that 
are catching a lot of light. So I can just kind of pull out some of that. And um, now let's, let's throw in some of these mountains back here. I'm going to go with, um, with this kind of grayish color. And we'll just, you know, kind of push these mountains up into the sky. And we'll go back with a brush and extract out for the snow that's on the mountains. Then later on, what you can do is put, uh, you know, some actual white paint where, where that snow is to make it brilliant in places and just leave where the canvas is showing through for some of the snow where it's a little bit more grayish. So let's, let's just push these up in here a little bit. Now that's too dark. Um, one thing you want to watch for is as you are applying your paint, just make sure that um, the value is correct right off the get-go. So where that is, it is not wanting to accept lighter paint over the top of it. You know, it's easy to um, to put dark over light, but it's really quite difficult to um, put light over dark. So dark over light goes on pretty easy. Now, we're not getting those dark darks in there, you'll notice. That's just the medium light, basically, because we're gonna, remember, we're going to go back in and create the really light lights, which means we also have to go back in and create these dark shadows in the mountains. Okay, so that's those peaks that are just kind of sticking way up there. And then we'll do some of this that is in the middle ground between that mountain and some of these mountains in the foreground. So let's go with a little bit more of a bluish color. And you probably end up altering this, but there's a start for you. It's, it's a basic value, it's a basic color. Okay, now let's move a little more into the foreground. Um, so these uh, mountains here, even though they're going to have a bluish quality about them, we're also going to add a little bit of green to that. So that we're still seeing some of the green. That atmospheric density hasn't completely dissolved that green away. And we're going to create... Oh, your iPhone's storage is full. Um, okay, well, you're getting it on the rest of it. That'll be okay. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. That's nice that you noticed that. Okay, so this is that mountain on the edge of the lake there. It looks like it's sitting back a little farther than the one right behind the castle. So the main thing that I'm creating with that one right there, this one, is Same basic color. And then we'll have, this one's going to be a lot more green. We're going to say it's a lot closer to us. And in the, um, in the photo reference, and it, you know, as you look at um, other photographs of um, this area, you can see that, um, yeah, this indeed is much closer to us than that mountain back there. I don't, really don't know what the distances are, but um, you know, I'm going to say in terms of several miles different between the one and the other. And this mountain looks like it's kind of pushed up at an angle. 
Um, you know, scientists tell us that these mountains get pushed up by the plates underneath. And, um, and so they don't just push straight up, otherwise everything would be real vertical, right? That kind of is like tipped plates that were in layers this way. When they tip, they kind of go up like that. So lots of times you get these kind of uh, diagonal sort of things going on. Um, and then there's this really dark, dark area. Trees and things back across the lake there and just kind of lay that dark strip in, have it come towards us a little bit. Where's the castle? Ooh, they <coughs> my castle. So, um, yeah, the castle, if I had to create this landscape around the castle, um, it would probably drive me nuts because everything I did would be stunning flow. And so instead, what I'll do is I'll go back and I'll just extract out for it and then we'll put it. It just makes it easier. It's not like one way is correct and the other way is completely wrong. It's just, you know, there's, there's easier ways and harder ways of doing all kinds of things, right? So, um, let's just put some of these little distant trees and stuff kind of sticking up back there. Not all of them should be the same, not all of them are the same. And, you know, what you can play around with back there is, you know, there's like little light areas and stuff. Um, those little light areas are probably buildings, you know, with the sunlight catching on little buildings or a dock or a boat or something. You don't have to know what something is, but, uh, you know, I, I, I say this often because I, I think it's a really good point. Quang Ho talks about this, that um, something's unique and specific. You, you know there's something there, you're not quite sure what it is even. Um, but it's got a basic shape to it. It's got a basic like lights or darks or color or whatever. And so, you know, if you just kind of throw that in kind of the way you're seeing it, um, others are going to notice that and say, oh, I'm not sure what that is, but there's something over there across the lake. So, um, okay. And I'm just kind of rubbing the edge of that because that will become eventually like some reflection in the water. And then we've got these little shoals right here and where the castle sits, it's kind of dark, dark shadow right, right where it's sitting at. And some of this could and to be darker, you always have where um, land and water meet, it gets much darker. And for a long time there, I was trying to figure out like, why does it get so much darker? Um, because it seems like it's all the same stuff. And um, so I started paying attention where water meets land, it erodes. And it has a tendency to erode up and under, and so it leaves like little gaps, you know, lots of times. Then also, that's the end of the land, so any plants have to stop right there. Um, and so what do they do? They have a tendency to kind of grow out over the water, but they can't go any farther than that. And so they create shadows. So you get those dark darks, that's, that's the bottom line to that. Okay. And then let's uh, let's just throw in some water. And I'm gonna make that little blue or blue. We may end up altering it a little or a lot. Just 
dependent on how we feel about it. And water has a tendency to like that. And so you get a lot of these horizontals. And see that color that we had kind of back here? That's just being reflected into the water. That's my story. Take it to so, it. Um, and then, you know, there's a reflective light on this, so when you kind of pull that down. Remember, whenever you're doing reflections in the water, um, two things you want to keep in mind. One is, is that it's an endless process between kind of doing your horizontals and doing your verticals. Because everything that's reflective has a tendency to kind of show itself up as a vertical. And everything that has to do with the surface of the water, so any ripples or ducks creating or boats creating ripples or whatever like that, has a tendency to show up as horizontals. So we end up doing you know, these kind of more discerning with the brush than you did with the See so how this gets a nice kind of watery, soft feel to it. You'll notice that I, I'm going straight down with all those strokes. If you go kind of sideways, even a little bit, a little bit of a diagonal, it will completely mess it up. See how that's a little diagonal right there? The reflection does not read correctly when it's like that. What I like to do is find my center. Use both hands, and that won't go into that. Anyhow, both hands, and pull straight down towards my center. And as I'm going across, so the more I go across, the more I'm starting to lean, right? Um, just shuffle. Go. If you're sitting down, you're going to have to take a chair. <laughs> so, um, I, I, I'm a big proponent of standing up while you paint. Um, I, there's absolutely nothing wrong with sitting down, but it has a tendency to make us um, avoid doing some of the things that could be helpful for us to do. Kind of like that. Those got pulled down pretty good. I keep saying there's this other thing that you need to keep in mind about reflectiveness and not getting to it. You really don't want to develop your reflection until you feel confident that you're finished with your, what I call, the real stuff. You know, so this is reality, all of this up here. This is reflective down here. And so if you develop this really nice reflection and then you go to paint the castle in or whatever, you know, or develop this mountain, it, you're going to get to where something, where you like kind of what it did, but it doesn't go with the reflection, you know. And now you're in a conundrum because you're going to have to repaint something. Okay. Um, let's kind of pull out for that castle and we'll get around to what it was really supposed to talk about today. I am the world's worst at saying, okay, we're going to stick with one concept, one concept. And then I talk about everything in the world except for that concept. So, apologize. I'm slowing down just a little bit, see if I can't get that castle pretty much correct. What I'm doing is, is I'm extracting out for the light. Any of it that is in shadow, I can just go back over that with um, some darker paint, and it's going to be fine. But I 
the stuff that's capturing the light, I just kind of like painting in the light by taking away the paint. If you're following what I'm saying, I'm getting a cramp in my hand. Sorry. <laughs> I've been working out, uh, not not working out like uh, left and lights or something. I've been working outside, uh, building a deck two weeks. No shade. Right in the sun. Now look, see this is that turret right there. Now I don't want to extract out for the whole turret. My left brain says that turret is a cone shaped thing. Extract out for all of it. But I'm extracting for the light. I'm just trying to capture the light. So, um, so all I'm doing is extracting where that uh, beautiful light is going to go and we can put dark darks in there for uh, the shadows later on um, this um, side to this huge big I'm not going to call it a turret but like um, part of the castle here it's not light light like this is but it's a little it's a little lighter And some of the rest of that. And some of the angles on the roof are a little lighter also. So you, you can just extract out a little bit for stuff like that. Craig. Uh-huh. So would you um, extract, what confuses me is you're extracting the light out before you even have the shape of the castle, because yeah. um, in my right, I don't know, right or left brain, I'd want to do the whole castle first, yeah, and then go back in. I understand. Yeah, um, and, uh, you know, it, um, beginning painting, um, sometimes it's really challenging to just take on just that lit section. Um, but I would um, suggest to you to do some exercises, um, uh, sketching basically. Um, where uh, th this is a fun thing to do, it's really fun. Just take some dark paint, cover the entire canvas with dark paint. I think maybe you've done this before. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then uh, something as simple as an apple. Um, you put an apple inside of a um, box with a directed light source and um, so that it's being really lit on one side of the apple. It's got a good shadow being cast on the other side. And you, you just extract out just the light um, for that. And uh, yes, it is difficult. It is difficult. But um, the more you do it, the more that you get comfortable with that idea. And what it does is it really, really forces you to use what's referred to as the right side of your brain. Um, so that holistic side that just kind of sees things for the way they actually are, um, as opposed to the way that your left brain tells it you it ought to be. Because your left brain has a tendency to see in terms of symbols that are in your head. We were talking about the cloud before, how it's like doop -de doop -de doop right? Yeah, no? Yeah. Well, that's, that's a left brain symbol of a cloud, you know, but uh, what we want to do is just set that left brain aside as much as we can uh, when we're talking about the painting like that. And so as an exercise, um, just practicing the extracting out, starting maybe with something like an apple that's, you know, more of a simplistic form. But you, you'll be surprised at how much your left brain will try to impede and want you to extract out all the way around a nice big circle, you know. And next thing you know, you've just got a big white spot where, you know, uh, where the left brain's talked you into doing that, because that's the shape of the apple, right? But uh, what we're just trying to see is just the light. And the more that we can concentrate on just the light, well, that goes back to what I teach the hand, which is in order of, uh, preference or, you know, uh, what's the most important is over here, all by itself, is light. If you capture light in a painting, you have a lovely painting. 
and it, you know you may mess up on all of these other kind of technical things, but um, it's still going to be beautiful if you have a, a pretty painting where it's captured light, you know. And then there's the, the technical things, the drawing and the values and the color and the edges and stuff like that. And they're all important, you know, but uh, the light is the real big. To me, it's the real big. So you'll notice I extracted out a little bit for the roof and for this one big piece going up here, but um, not a lot. And I'm going to go back in, and I'm going to extract out a little bit for some of that snow on the mountain, see if I can't get it a little bit lighter. Just where some of that snow is. It's real bright on the sides up here too, so let's just pull off some of that. Now see, you're, as you develop that, you're going to end up putting in shadows, you can end up um, softening out edges of, you know, particularly clouds where they're so soft. This is some of those highest peaks that are capturing that snow. You can get that shape a little better with the uh, brush than you can with the paint, with the uh, paper towel. You see how some of this is standing out a little bit compared to what seemed like it was almost white before. To create a lighter side to your sky over where your light is coming from, get it a little darker over away from the light. And that actually gives this um, subconscious notion that... Um, that the light's coming from over here. So we're gonna kind of follow through with that concept. And so I'm creating some blues, but I'm also gonna throw a little bit of cat orange in with my blue. And that is going to neutralize that blue. So there's plenty of other videos that I have on this whole notion of neutralizing without completely diminishing a color. So I'm going to get it not stormy feeling, hopefully, but um, to where the sky just gets a little darker. Maybe a little cloudier over to the left, so that as I'm developing this, I can create the sense of light on objects. Because if you don't have dark to light in your painting, are you possibly going to create a sense of actually bright light? And you'll notice these mountains, they are really, you know, just shining. It's beautiful the way they're shining. So what I'm doing is, is particularly in the area where those where those mountains are. I want to create some darker darks in my clouds and my sky. And all of a sudden, the mountains begin to stand out because of that contrast between the two. I'm going to get it a little grayer as I go up. And I'm going to get it a little darker, too. Well, I talk about this often enough that if you are creating... Um, a color of paint, certain value of paint, certain color of paint. One of the things you want to think about is what paint are you using to do that 
as far as how light to dark that pane is. Because if, um, if you're trying to create a blue color, a light blue, let's say something you have to mix, let's say a green, you want to create a nice spring green and you start using for that spring green you start using a, uh, a dark ultramarine blue color how are you going to get a light spring green out of a dark blue um, you may want to use a manganese blue or a severs blue something that is going to um, something that's going to give you that value right off the get-go so then if you use a nice light lemon yellow to go along with that that's going to help you to um, create that nice spring green color I'm going to drop this down even a little bit more right in this area here. Look how dark I'm going with that. But the darker I get some of this, the more that those mountains begin to stand out. We'll start working our way over to the right here a little bit. You notice I keep using this paper towel to soften this out as I'm, you know, clouds are not big chunks of marshmallows in the sky. <laughs> no, they just aren't. They, um, they're very soft. They're little water and ice crystals floating around in the air. And um, if we put on this thick, hard paint, um, hard edge. It's probably not going to come out looking soft. It's not going to come out looking like a little floating bits of water in the air, humidity that's kind of gathered together. Uh, that's what it is. It is just thick humidity up there in the air. Now, I, I don't tell people to use their fingers because actually there's a lot of dangerous chemicals in your uh, paints. But um, I hate to say it, but I, I can't seem to get through a painting without fussing around with it with my fingers. Because you know what, you can feel it with your fingers, you can feel exactly how wet or how dry that paint is getting. And there's a point, at some point, where the uh, paint begins to sort of dry, and when it does, um, then you can move it, you can feel it as it's drying, like what it's doing. I'm not quite sure how to explain that, but it, um, it helps you to be able to um, Now you notice almost everything that I'm doing lost my train of thought there y'all. Okay, I'm getting old. Um, everything that I'm doing up here in the sky, I'm trying to head it in a more or less um, cool direction so that everything has some nice cool highlights to it. So we're staying over that blue purple range. When we get down to these mountains, we're still going to be doing a lot of um, greens and so forth that are in that blue range. 
You notice I'm not looking at the reference all the time when I'm doing this. I'm following it in a sense, but a lot of this is being guided by the idea, two, two ideas. One is, is if you go out and do a lot of plain air painting, you're going to find that you, um, you get a sense for what clouds do, what clouds look like. And um, excuse me. And you you'll get an idea of that clouds move. That this is probably the most important lesson you can get on clouds is that a cloud isn't a cloud. It changes and moves all the time. So, um, you know, if you're trying to just paint that cloud, by the time you do a little mixing, a little painting, and look up, oh, it's changed again. You know, so keep that in mind as you're painting a cloud, that it's more about the feel of the cloud and less about what you're actually seeing. It, it's the kind of things that it does, you know, and so you get to where you kind of know that. I, I remember I was at a workshop in Arizona with John Buterson, and he was teaching about doing the clouds up against the mountains and so forth, and um, I was asking him questions and about it, kind of an old said, hippie yeah. sort of thing to say, you know. Um, you got to be one with the cloud, <laughs> you know. And, and uh, at the time, I was just kind of laughing in my mind, you know, that's kind of silly. But you know what? Since then, I've realized that what he was saying to me, although language is such a poor form of communication, you know. Uh, that uh, it's absolutely true. You have to get the sense of what that does. Got to kind of feel it, and once you do, things will start kind of working for you as far as clouds are concerned. Okay, so, <laughs> feel the cloud. Here. You also notice that in clouds that they change colors. Um, I was on my way home the other day, and uh, it was a bright blue sky, just brilliant blue sky, and it was the leftovers of some of the clouds from the storm the previous evening, and uh, there was these little, just little bitty floating clouds, right? They were black as they could be, almost black, and I was like, I need to like get online and try to find out scientifically why would we see dark, dark clouds, just little ones, because I, I just always assumed like the clouds undershadow their own selves, and so they create some of those darks. But it, it hit me as I saw that, that, that that's not always true. There's something, maybe there's uh, something they picked up in the clouds, like salts or what frogs <laughs> y'all ever see any of that old stuff like where it actually rained frogs and you know something Idaho you know back in 1868 yeah. okay. so. another thing you want to make sure you don't do is create soldiers the soldiers are where you're creating the same shapes over and over, and it is so easy to do. But try to change up those colors. You know, this is kind of pretty the way it's coming out with these almost kind of purplish little highlights on here. We'll, we'll do something to kind of um, create some duller stuff so that these colors stay kind of pretty looking. Um, You'll have clouds that, if you really look at them, the clouds tend to be grays, but they are grays in a variety of colors. So you have reddish grays sometimes, you have greenish grays, particularly out at the ocean for some reason. 
uh, greenish grays. And um, bluish grays, of course, are very, very common among clouds. But uh, if you have a bunch of tattered clouds, you'll find that they are different colors next time you're out, particularly like after a storm or something. Be paying attention to uh, the colors of the grays in the clouds. And it's interesting how many different colors you're going to note if you start paying attention to that. I have noticed more like red, not red reds, but like a little pinkish in the clouds. And I, they probably have already been there, but I didn't pay attention to them until I started taking this class. And now I'm dissecting everything. But yeah, pinkish red. I'll tell you what, taking an art class and really studying, really observing, observing, mm -hmm. all of a sudden, I, I, almost every student that I've had that's been with me for a number of years has said, I didn't realize I was blind before. Mm -hmm. Now now I'm seeing for the first time. You know, it's a really cool. So true. So I, I'm, I'm creating some uh, grayer grays and a little bit darker grays to go kind of on the shadow side of some of these clouds, kind of underneath some of this. I don't want to just do nothing but clouds this whole painting session. We'll move on in a minute to some of this other. Because each time we get together, hopefully what I'm doing is kind of not just standing up here painting in front of you, but... This um, is really helpful to me. Oh, good. Um, but I also kind of want to move on and do some things. You'll notice that I can make this stand out a little brighter again by creating some darker darks kind of around it. As you're doing clouds, try to think in terms of, see how I just did this, I just created kind of a shape to a cloud by just adding some darks in where it was a little lighter down here. And all of a sudden that becomes another cloud. You don't have to just create clouds by adding something, adding white or adding light. And, uh, you know, a lot of clouds are very white or white-ish. You know, so um, I'm just kind of doing some of the dark darks right now. And, um, and then we're going to add some of those highlights. Be frugal with your highlights, particularly in this case, because as we were talking about before, um, in this painting, we're trying to get this warm area to be our point of interest. And if we start making this incredible, we forget all about that, right? So, we do want all aspects of our painting to be good, you know, well done. But um, you want certain portions of your painting, you're talking about creating a point of interest, you want certain portions of your painting to be relatively uninteresting. And that's kind of seems like a counterintuitive sort of thing, you know, because like, well, I don't want my painting to be uninteresting, but if there isn't something less interesting than something else, then uh, no one knows where to look. You just kind of get overwhelmed and, uh, and probably bug out from the painting. So, um, yeah, they'll just walk right on by it. You, know, you have it in the gallery and um, they'll see something else that catches their interest. So I'm putting just a little bit of highlight on the clouds. I could make that much more 
impressive, but if I do, again, it's pulling my attention away from down here. So let's be careful. about just how much we create points of interest up here. All of this, y'all, can be developed more and more and more. Um, so as I quite often teach, what you want to do is bring the whole painting another layer of in focus and then do the whole painting that way and then bring it a little bit more in focus you go back around cycle back around to it again There's some big underheads up here, but um, where it's real bright white, don't don't just mimic that. Do it a little bit, maybe, because you've got a reference to go by. So you don't need to paint it all out of your head. But having said that, don't make it too terribly impressive over here. You don't want to take the eye away from your main goal is to get them okay. to hear. Hey there, I hope you enjoyed that video and I hope you're getting a lot of value out of all of these videos that we're posting on the artist Craig Richards channel. Um, you know, there's all kinds of how-tos, there's the weekly paint class, uh, and there's occasional outings like uh, going out in plain air somewhere. We're going to be going down the Yadkin River in the spring, uh, going to museums, things like that. I think you'd enjoy those. Um, if you're getting value out of these, then uh, do the, uh, like, subscribe, uh, hit the notification bell. Uh, you have to subscribe in order to be able to hit the notification bell, and that's for you. Um, the reason I'm saying that is so that uh, you know when the next paint class is coming out, so that if you're working on a painting and we're doing it again the next week, that you can follow along with us. And leave us comments, you know, not just for me, but for the students as well. Say, you know, Deb, you did a great painting. Kitty, you did a great painting. Or Craig, you did a great demonstration this week. Um, that builds us up. And we want to build you up as well. We want to help you to keep painting and keep growing. You're doing great. Uh, don't tell yourself you're not. Um, you are doing wonderful. Just keep at it and you'll learn and grow each week with us. So, happy painting.